So this is Patrick. Went to Lambda School. He finished Lambda School. How many different companies did you do interviews for? So out of all of the companies I applied for, I applied to th over a thousand positions. Well, total interviews is 45, but a lot of them were just different positions with the same company. Did they give you stuff to prepare for, or did they tell you, or that how, how did they go? Were they typical like screening and then please do a co-test and then please come in? So the ones that the ones that were most common was you had your phone screen where they just kind of asked who you were, you know, like what got you into coding, what do you know about the business, um, and you know, like what's your interest in applying for the company. And then that was usually like the first interviews for a lot of them. And then for the companies that moved me forward after that, um, I think there were about, out of the 43, I think it was like 18 of them, I moved on past the first interview. For a lot of those, it went to a second interview with the team lead, and then it would be either a coach test or like a multiple choice questionnaire. And then you would go in person and do like, you know, in-person interviews slash whiteboarding. What was the hardest whiteboard test you had? That was for one of the fan companies that I applied to. Can you say which fan company? Yes, Netflix. You could have worked at Netflix if you wanted to, but the drive was really long and the pay wasn't where it needed to be to basically, for you to be able to live where, right. you know, what Palo Alto. The offer was for 110K and I want to preface this, this is the Bay Area, so 110,000 is not 110,000 everywhere else. You're looking at about 55, 50,000 a year anywhere else. I didn't feel that it was just a good enough offer to stay in the Bay Area and take that job. Um, but it was really hard to say no to Netflix, one of the big fan companies. So. I think one of, the, one of the things here, so everyone thinks that if you're the best engineer you can be, you have to work at one of these companies. But that's not true because you, you, you went there, you got the job offer, you made it happen, and you chose you still chose not to go there because you thought that there would be better, maybe more of a better cost of living to salary ratio. But everyone thinks that you have to go work at Google and once you get to Google, you've made it, you're like top tier. And so I'm sure that would have looked great on your resume going forward, but like, you know that you could go back there and you could pass all the interviews and, and get another offer if you wanted to again. I think the thing that's important to understand is like you said, that just because it's a fan company doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good offer and that it's a good um, choice to go to. You have to evaluate your needs at the time and match that with what the company is willing to pay. And if it's not enough for you to survive, then it's gotta be a no, regardless if it's a top tier company or not. I think people just get so hung up on like all the best engineers work here because if you can get a job over here, you're one of the best engineers, and I'm sure there are a lot of other engineers that could work at these companies that just choose not to because it just doesn't work out and then they want a smaller company experience. Maybe they just don't want to live in Silicon Valley. Maybe they want to live closer to their family and their relatives or wherever it is, whatever their needs are. It's just In companies like Google, they don't let you do remote work, so you have to be at one of their buildings. What was the whiteboard problem for Netflix? So for Netflix, the, what they wanted me to do was create my own AVL tree from scratch. And that includes methods and um, what happened was you would write it on the whiteboard and then they would take the exact code you wrote because you would choose what coding language you're gonna code it in and they would have they have a person with an IDE on a computer and they take exactly what you wrote will copy basically that down into the IDE and run it and if it doesn't run the first time then you fail. But you pass. But I passed because I like data structures and algorithms. So for that specific interview, data structures and algorithms were worth yes. it. I, I would advise that if anyone is applying to fan companies, the number one thing that they're going to do nine times out of 10 is give you, if anyone knows what leak code is, leak code medium or hard problems. So study those. Okay, how many other times did you do data structures and algorithms? Never, I've none since Netflix. The ones that you showed in our other videos were just you built a few applications. Yeah, they, get, they would give me a spec and a design file and they would say build this. It should take X amount of hours, have it done by us for us by Friday and let us know how long it took you. Or it would be like a bug fix on something that's already created. So just the one was, just the one fan company was data structures and algorithms. Yep. I'm sure you don't regret learning it. I'm sure they come in handy. I think you mentioned that you had to do it at work like one time already. Yeah, I had to, utilizing a stack um, 
in order to kind of recursively go through a pivot grid to open up all of the columns and rows. I've used it, and that's the only time I've ever. What was the hardest interview that you got? Hardest? Like, like total process, what was the hardest, most difficult company for you? I think the hardest for me was probably with um, uh, BR, Bleacher Report, yeah. because of the emotional toll it took on me. I had just, you know, lost that, got that offer rescinded from the previous company, and, you know, we already know that whole deal. I basically asked if I could have a couple more days to consider the offer. They only gave me two. Um, because I wanted to finish out that last interview that I had already committed to. And they said, yeah, sure, sure, that's fine. And then the very next day they rescinded their offer. And so that hurt. But I was on the last interview with Bleacher Report, and so I figured, okay, I'll just go in, I'll nail it. As long as I don't say anything stupid, I should be okay, right? And you go in, and they misconstrue what you say when you say something like, because, you know, it was the QA guys who came in and talked to me, as, which was one part of the six-hour interview, and they go, so how do you feel about testing your own code? And I go, well, I've never had the ability to test code in a production environment for a job before, so I think it'll be really interesting when I'm hired to be able to you know, do something like that. I've only ever done it with Jest personally on my React applications. And they take that and they think that I mean that I hate testing and I'm not willing to do it on the job. And so getting that no and that email, it just... It was like that extra emotional stake through the heart, and that made it harder for me, I think, than most. Yeah, and then you had like no, you had like nothing for like three months, and I know it feels like forever when you're applying. It feels like f forever it when you like when you like you just gotta wait on them, and then, like you're just supposed to build side apps, and then you're like you see the bank account going down, and then you're like, I'm just building side apps, hoping this works, and then well, finally you got a job offer. But maybe let's answer some of the questions that were in the live stream last night that were pretty popular. How? overwhelmed did you feel when you were uh, learning this stuff? Well, I was lucky enough to have gone through an Associates of Science degree program uh, at my community college where I learned C++, so it wasn't as difficult. Um, I know with other people who just have no coding background, never did what I did, and are just going straight into Lambda from the people who were in my cohort, they said it was just it was it was very hard it's a big adjustment it's a different mindset than they're used to for me personally it was a little bit more of an easier transition what kind of supplemental material did you do when you were learning code um so a lot of the stuff that i did was leak code hacker rank um i would help people in the discord channel to uh, you know bug fix their code and it was a good way for me to kind of bounce ideas off of them and learn myself um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that if you teach you don't actually know what you're doing that as a, if you're teaching, that means you're a failure in your industry and that's all you can do. Those who can't do teach, and I don't think that's true at all. If you can explain something in programming and technical concepts. At a high level and make it easily digestible, then that means you're obviously an expert at that concept. That was probably the best way for me to learn stuff is that I could actually teach it to people. That's how you know, you know what you're talking about. And so, um, a lot of pair programming during Lambda, I recommend it for everybody, especially the people I was teaching as my time as a TA. But yeah, that's basically a lot of what I was doing. What would you say to someone who's like discouraged and, and trying to do this, but they got kids and they don't got time and like, what would be some words of advice? Well, I don't want to do the whole classic like, well, I can do it, you can too kind of thing because I don't, wanna, I don't think that I'm that special, but I want you to know that I was there too and it's very, very hard emotionally, physically, it's physically exhausting. But if you push through and you keep going, there is a light at the end and you will succeed. So don't give up. What do you think about people that, that can't do like Lambda and they do like Udemy or whatever? Do you have any advice for them who are like self-teaching because the bootcamp route doesn't work? Take those projects that you're learning on Udemy, mold them into something, find, find ways you can take those projects and make them into something else, but utilize the same exact kind of concepts behind them and make something unique. So many times you see people that are just copy pasting like the, the to-do app from Colt Steel or um, the, 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 the view app from Colt, you know, like a lot of Colt Steel's projects, you just copy and paste it with a little bit of minor adjustments. It's not gonna fly and you're really not learning anything. All you're doing is watching someone write code and then following suit. That's not how you learn. You, what you should do 
is when you're learning a new concept, you pause it and you fiddle around with it, understand how it works, do that extra due diligence, try to understand it. Otherwise, all you're doing is just following the same circle of, I bought a course, I write the same exact stuff they do, I learn nothing. I buy a course, I write, the, and then you get nowhere. And that's where a lot of people who do the Udemy or the Freed Code Camp path, they just feel like they're not getting anywhere because they're not actually learning. Just copy pasting. Exactly. Without, Without actually copy copying and pasting. How many actual job offers did you get? Do you remember like the exact count? So I got a job offer from Netflix, like we talked about. I got a job offer from the company that I'm at now. I count that. I got a job offer from uh, Nabis, which is a company in Oakland, California. I got a job offer from, uh, I can't remember, they're called SPC or SPF. It's Sustainable Capital Finance. SCF, um, and then I got a job offer from WGU. Five job offers compared to actual like 45 different interviews for different positions. Five to 45 is not, it's not a bad ratio. I'd say you did better than like, well, compared to job applications sent out, so like you would say a thousand, like really a thousand. I, there's, uh, you get this little hired app that um, Lambda has you do, and every time you apply it basically adds it to the list. It's like a drag and drop Kanban board of jobs that you've applied to. The thing that people have to understand is out of the 1,000 applications, only about 100 of them, only about at the end where it was like 100 apps after 1,000 was like out of state. It was like out of the, you know, the Bay Area. And so that's when I started actually getting more um, hits back. So you're saying that the saturation of that area was a big factor in preventing me from getting a job. That's where all of the fun, the fun companies with all the money and the big, you know, the commercials and they're like, work here. And it's just like the, the dream job area. So obviously oversaturated, but there's a lot of cool hidden jobs that are just like low key, we need software engineers. They fly under the radar because they know if they start advertising this stuff, you know, like you didn't know that you're going to be able to work remote a couple of days a week when you got that job. And they're like, oh, by the way, need a couple of days a week from home. Just let me know. Yeah, it was it was pretty it was pretty cool. They never told me that during the interview process. And of course, I didn't ask. And that's not to say I'm going to preface this is not that's not to say I didn't get job offers in the Bay Area. I did out of the five that I had, three of them were. But the 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 frequency of having more than one interview skyrocketed when I started looking outside of the Bay Area. Do you, I think that you're pretty financially well off, even though that you have to pay them back and you're paying child support. Yeah. So just by myself, this isn't considering my girlfriend's finances. I pay in a range of 700 to $1,400 to Lambda Beck. And I'm not giving the number accurately because I don't want people to be able to kind of backtrack that to find out what I'm making. After Lambda, after child support and after rent and everything else that I have to pay for, I'm pocketing about $1,200 still a month. Just fun money? Just fun money. And so obviously I'm still financially sustainable, $1,200. That's more than I've ever had left over from a check ever. But obviously I'm going to be putting that into investments. And you live in Austin, Texas. And it's cheaper cost of living than the Bay Area. What is your rent? I pay sixteen fifty a month, before, and that's before like water bill and electric bill and stuff. How much does house cost? But well, you got split with three people, yes. so it's gonna go down, and you'll have more money to save after your roommates start contributing rent. Right. It's crazy. So since you got your job, they put you on the hiring team, and you've kind of been around what companies look for and how they hire. So you kind of had that undercover information. What are some tips that you know now when you were applying that you didn't know that you could give to other people? I think one suggestion I would say for people on their um, resumes is don't ever be too specific about your skill level with a, with a, a framework or a language. Let the interviewer ask you that and assess that for themselves. Don't do it to you yourself because then that disappoints the interviewer. Expert to you and expert to them can be very, very different. Another thing that's very specific is if you can ask the hiring manager just what the company needs are right now and what they're looking for, it might be easier to tailor a specific resume for that company to kind of put where you shine for those needs. So for instance, with my company, we are looking for someone who's good at documentating and um, commenting their code and making sure that you know there's a wiki for everything that we're doing. Um, one of the people that we interviewed, documentation 
all over, right? Clear, concise links, explains what it ha does, shows screenshots of how to do things, and that, that was perfect. Like for our company needs, that guy would have probably gotten hired. A lot of people will message me on LinkedIn and ask, you know, like, oh, is your company hiring? I think a better question would not be that if we're hiring, but if we are hiring, what are you looking for in terms of a developer? I'm more happy to talk about my company's needs than I am if I'm willing to give you an internal recommendation or if we're hiring. It doesn't come off as a selfish desire, it comes off as a selfless want to help the company and be a part of the company. It might be weird to ask, but you should take every advantage you can to get in front and ahead of everyone else on the stack. I think we're good. I think there's some gold. I think there's some gems here. If anyone else has any other questions that I haven't, that we haven't talked about, or you just have some lingering questions with Josh's video, comment them down below. I'm always looking in the comment section and I'm happy to help out or join the Discord in the link down below. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe now.